The concept of today's tech giants often embodies a glamorous image. Modern offices, innovative technology, and a relaxed, collaborative work environment. This was precisely the vision WeWork marketed, offering shared office spaces to freelancers, small businesses, and even major tech players. Initially, WeWork soared as a rapidly expanding startup, aiming for a significant 47 billion IPO in September of 2019. However, scrutiny turned towards the company, particularly its founder and CEO, Adam Newman. As the IPO faltered and Newman's leadership faced criticism, the narrative of WeWork shifted. Once hailed as a major tech contender, WeWork now grapples with potential instability, casting doubt on its future. This is what tomorrow looks like. Let there be lights and wide open spaces. This isn't a place for people to punch in and out. WeWork's role is to elevate the world's consciousness. <laughs> WeWork isn't just a company. It's a movement. Co-working spaces have been around since the 1990s, but gained immense popularity after 2005. Riding this trend, WeWork emerged in 2010. What set them apart was their knack for marketing an appealing concept, open collaborative spaces that felt refreshingly different from traditional offices. Leveraging their founders' upbringing in communal living, they emphasized community, presenting themselves as a tech-driven company using data analytics to enhance workspace efficiency. Understanding how people utilized spaces guided their expansion strategy and design aesthetics. This strategy quickly attracted a niche market, propelling WeWork's rapid growth, bolstered by substantial backing from major investors like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, SoftBank, and even Amazon. Overall, since 2009, WeWork secured $14.2 billion in funding notably facilitated by low interest rates, which was propagated by the 2008 financial crisis. If you want to know more of what causes the 2008 financial crisis, be sure to check out the link in the video description. Overall, this low interest rate encourages investment firms to support growing businesses. One influential figure in the funding of WeWork was no other than Masayoshi Son. Sun's legacy includes a pivotal investment of Alibaba, where he granted $20 million to a young Jack Ma in the year 2000, marking one of the most significant investments in history. In August of 2017, Sun met Adam Newman at a conference where an investment deal of $4.4 billion was made to invest in WeWork. WeWork, fueled by investor funds, expanded rapidly amassing more than 800 locations across hundreds of cities globally. However, WeWork's ambitions under Newman extended beyond office rentals. It rebranded as the We Company, introducing ventures like We Live, offering furnished apartments, and We Grow, an educational initiative targeting young children with tuition fees ranging from $22,000 to $42,000. If as an entrepreneur I chose to come to you and raise money from you, I have now committed to you to make you money in return. It's no more a question on am I going to monetize for you. I have to because I took money from you. If, we, if this was our next business and we funded it ourselves, then we can do whatever we want and not give any answers. So if you're asking me, am I and are we as a team committed to monetize not only for our investors but also for our employees, the answer is 100%. Is an IPO next year the perfect answer? We're going to ask ourselves what's best for the employees, what's best for the members, and I guarantee you that's what's best for both of them will end up being best for the investors. Despite WeWork's apparent success in securing substantial funding and rapid growth, doubts lingered. While growing into a corporate giant, the company wasn't able to generate any sort of profits. WeWork, often claiming as a tech company status, fundamentally operates as a landlord. 
Unlike tech firms selling hardware and software, WeWork simply rents office spaces while using existing technologies from other companies for better operational decisions. The challenge emerges here. How can a landlord-style company achieve the explosive growth and returns typically seen in tech? I say we, you say work, we, work, we, work, we, work. Beneath the facade of a thriving tech enterprise lies the truth. A company yet to turn a profit, celebrated as an industry titan. Investors started scrutinizing WeWork due to a fundamental risk in its business model. WeWork typically commits to 15-year leases with property owners, paying a fixed annual fee for leasing land, then subleasing the space to users. Profits would increase due to high occupancy rates or rising property values. However, if occupancy drops or property prices drop, WeWork could face a financial squeeze because it is obligated to pay the agreed-upon lease amount despite experiencing reduced income. To mitigate this risk, WeWork employs a subsidiary-based structure, isolating leases in different areas. This setup prevents failure in one area from adversely affecting the entire business. However, Doubts persist about WeWork's resilience during economic downturns, especially if demand for co-working spaces declines. Investors began noticing significant issues as WeWork geared up for an IPO in September 2019. The trouble started in January, when SoftBank, a major investor, scaled back its planned $16 billion investment to just $2 billion citing a drop in SoftBank's share price. This move raised concerns that SoftBank might reconsider its support for WeWork altogether. As WeWork initiated its IPO filings, investors eagerly awaited the disclosed information. Such filings include detailed financials, business models, and various disclosures. It's the moment a company transitions from private to public. And during this phase, doubts surfaced regarding WeWork's so-called $47 billion valuation. Internal documents from WeWork's IPO filings revealed a worrying trend, where each new customer was costing the company over $5,000. Additionally, the company's valuation had plummeted by almost 80% within the year. These revelations, coupled with financial challenges, cast shadows on the company's founder and CEO, Adam Newman, further adding to investor skepticism. As interest in WeWork's IPO intensified, so did reports, not just about the company, but also about Newman himself. Allegations surfaced regarding his substance use and workplace behavior, creating an impression that Newman himself has a darker side possibly influenced by his circle. In 2016, shortly after Adam Newman terminated 7% of his workforce, he held a company-wide meeting. After justifying the layoffs, he surprised the staff with trays of tequila shots and a performance by a renowned rapper from Run DMC. Newman and some employees danced while others observed and couldn't seem to wrap their heads around Newman's actions. According to former executives, there are accounts of Newman having a habit to smoke before meetings and also attempt to transport cannabis into Israel, where it's illegal. On a private jet trip to Israel, the flight crew discovered a stash inside a cereal box. Fearing a marijuana trafficking incident, the jet's owner ordered it to be returned to the US, leaving Newman and his friend stranded in Israel before taking a separate flight back to the US. Newman's personal office boasted a meditation room, a whiteboard for his spontaneous ideas, and a prominently displayed, apparently photoshopped image of himself surfing. At times, Adam Newman exhibited tyrannical behavior, instilling fear in the office. Former employees described an environment where opposing him was unwelcome, often leading to humiliation. Several of Newman's close friends and family held senior leadership roles within the company, which created a perceived conflict of interest, adding to the unease among employees. 
While in June 2019, WeWork also faced three ongoing lawsuits, allegations of age discrimination and two cases of sexual harassment. Beyond unconventional office practices, investors expressed skepticism about Newman's financial conduct. He profited from renting properties he owned to WeWork, creating a conflict of interest. Newman also borrowed hundreds of millions from the company at exceptionally low interest rates to purchase a $60 million jet despite substantial losses, and sold hundreds of million in company shares, signaling a lack of confidence in the company's future. As reports on Newman's character and the company's troubled state emerged, investor confidence plummeted, leading to an indefinite postponement of the IPO. Newman was ousted as CEO required to resign, while the $60 million jet was removed. Despite all this, he was able to walk away with $1.7 billion, while thousands of employees faced job uncertainty. The primary casualty of the WeWork fiasco is Masayoshi Son, SoftBank's chairman, who incurred substantial financial losses, jeopardizing his reputation as a wise investor. Moreover, external factors, notably the health of the financial markets, pose an additional threat, a turmoil in the repo market, essential for daily financial operations, witnessed an unexplained failure on September 17, 2019, leading to the injection of billions to save it. Significant portions of these funds were tied to mortgage-backed securities, hinting a potential collapse of the real estate sector. If this hint of an impending real estate downturn materializes, it could swiftly crush WeWork and potentially devastate the company, given that real estate constitutes the primary function of WeWork's business model. SoftBank's renowned $100 billion vision fund incurred a significant $17.7 billion loss from 2019 to 2020, largely attributed to their ill-fated investments in Uber and WeWork. WeWork's valuation plummeted from $47 billion to a mere $2.9 billion within a year, prompting SoftBank to retract $3 billion in investment. In response, WeWork retaliated with a lawsuit against SoftBank for backing out on the agreement, while former WeWork CEO Adam Newman stands to gain a staggering $970 million from selling his WeWork stock directly to SoftBank if the lawsuit ends in his favor. Newman filed his lawsuit against SoftBank with the aim of merging it with the board's lawsuit. Amidst this, the onset of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020 dealt a severe blow to WeWork. Government restrictions led to widespread office vacancies for months, adding to the financial strain as rent obligations persisted, even after restrictions eased. WeWork continues to burn through cash, operating at a fraction of its previous value. As for Newman, at the age of 45, with a net worth of $1.7 billion, he is currently doing more than fine, with a lavish new Miami home. Even as WeWork continues its downfall, he persists in seeking new investors to fund other startups aimed at transforming the way we live at home. Currently, WeWork remains operational despite enduring a staggering 99% decline in value since October 2021. From a peak trading value of $520 per share, it now hovers at a mere 25 cents. Businesses worldwide are awakening to the realization that a physical office is unnecessary for numerous job positions, especially with the advancement of technologies. This widespread demonstration of remote work's viability on a global scale shouldn't be underestimated. While some individuals may return to traditional office settings, many won't. These shifts raise questions about the future demand for shared workspaces like WeWork. The evolving landscape of work presents uncertainty, but WeWork's future appears even more precarious. Only time will tell if they can weather these changes and survive. Achieving a return to its former valuation necessitates extensive restructuring and many lease terminations, indicating a long road to recovery. <laughs>